Okay, so we're going to go ahead and talk about cats. The first thing we want to know, uh, obviously, that th cats basically have three names. Uh, they have their, wait, no, that's something else. <laughs> so, you know, name you call them, <laughs> the fancy name, and the name they only know for themselves. Uh, no, you're not in the wrong talk. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead uh, and talk about um, the cats today. Yes, I am feline fine today, so no weird, no, no problem there. Uh, sorry, at the edge of a whisker. So, uh, so what we're going to talk about is start off. I think the best way is where you know the cats came into the lives of humans. How they just kind of you know move their way in. They seem to had a, a special purpose uh, in doing so. <laughs> so, oh, this is going to get old really quick, right? The cat right. scratch fever. Okay, so, uh, so. The Egyptians uh, were uh, widely known for supposedly domesticating the cat sometime after 3000 BCE. Uh, we will realize today uh, that the cat really wasn't that domesticated. In fact, in many ways, the cat domesticated us. <laughs> so it kind of works the opposite way of those poor dogs. You know, dogs, I gotta tell you, you know, they descended from wolves and they kind of followed us around and uh, because we had lots of food, right? Lots of food, lots of scraps at, at our various campsites during the Paleolithic era, you know, going from camp to camp to camp, the dogs kind of followed and then they kind of wormed or warmed their way into our lives. Uh, and uh, then all of a sudden they became dependent upon it. Well, cats are very independent. I know you probably don't believe that, but cats are, can, can survive without you. Your dog may not. <laughs> the world is coming to an end for your dog because they are pack animals. And as pack animals, they, 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 they think you are part of the pack. But cats are so independent so yes, yeah, so cats live for thousands of years, believe it or not, alongside humans, there's evidence for it before they were actually supposedly uh, domesticated. Uh, so taking a look here, uh, in general, uh, there's reasons why. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, especially during the period of time, we go from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic age, we have the advent of agriculture. And with agriculture, uh, you're growing crops, guess what? More than just you want to have the, the produce from those crops. Uh, you're going to have lots of vermin, right? And mice and rats and other kinds of things. And, and so the rodent population was kind of a problem. Well, the cats, they like to eat rodents. And so they started to hang around the crops. And uh, that proved to be very useful. <laughs> for for us humans uh, who are trying to survive because, you know, uh, the cats ate the rodents. The rodents, of course, are the ones who ate the produce and everybody's happy. And of course, the cat uh, is there, of course, licking its paws with complete contentment. Now, there is kind of an anomaly here. The first time that uh, the earliest evidence that we see a relationship be between a cat and a human does go back a little ways. Um, it's rather, it's kind of cute. Uh, they found this on the island of Cyprus uh, at a burial site uh, that is between 830 to 8, uh, sorry, yeah, 8,300 uh, 8, 8, to um, 8,200 years ago. So we're looking at, you know, pretty much uh, around, you know, 6,000 BCE. You have this burial site, and what you have here is a human that was intentionally buried with a cat. Now, this is during a time where, I mean, this is, is 3,000 years before they're supposedly domesticated. And apparently, uh, this human and this cat had some kind of relationship uh, where the cat was intentionally and in a nice way buried together. So it wasn't one of those things where you know, the cat's like, oh, you're dead now. So let's go ahead and have an extra meal. I mean, you've heard that, right? You know, uh, you know, cats love us. Uh, and then cats, when we die, they still love us. <laughs> so we're, we're a special kind of tuna. Anyway, so there you have it. So now we take a look at the cat lineages. Uh, basically, uh, you have two different groups, 
two different groups, uh, two major ones of domestic feline. Uh, one starts, the first one starts in Southwest Asia, Southwest Asia, and starts to slowly migrate to Europe around uh, 4,400 BCE. And they were, these cats, they were more wild. They were more frisky, is maybe the word for it. Um, uh, and they're not as interested in hanging out with humans. They really weren't. Uh, this species did follow around the, uh, the human population, uh, especially with the, of course, the advent of agriculture. And uh, they did eat the rats. They had, they had the varmint, um, had good meals there. And, uh, and they were scavengers. But this particular breed just didn't like to hang around humans. They just didn't. Uh, we take a look at this. Uh, uh, they typically were smaller uh, and uh, they had a kind of a sandy colored uh, 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 look. They look they look a lot like the, uh, the mackerel tabby. You know the mackerel tabbies? <laughs> you're going you know uh, well those believe it or not those are the unfriendly ones wait <laughs> you can can you see that a little bit right right okay so the macro tabbies i hope i'm not offending anybody with a macro color tabby i apologize ahead of time they're, they're oftentimes understood as turkish cats uh and uh we know that they were around uh, way earlier you know nine thousand to uh around seven thousand bce they were deep uh, in the area of, of the Middle East, moving towards Anatolia. Uh, and then uh, they, they crossed over uh, into Eastern Europe, uh, first to Romania and then to Bulgaria. And they kind of moved down the way. Uh, Romania, I'd say around 3,200 BCE. So that's the, that's the Cat A group, right? Are those coming in with the Indo-European invaders? So, with that? So, so it's interesting that you bring that up. So the question that was asked is, do they come in with the Indo-European invaders? And it does appear that they follow a certain migrational route that does coincide with many Indo-European groups. So it does look like they're following, but they're also hanging around the areas where uh, they adapt agriculture because Indo-Europeans typically uh, were, were not agricultural, but when they start settling down, yes, then they, when they start migrating and, and having, having adopted uh, agriculture, then yes, that's happening. And so they would be following those, like for example, uh, that would become the Hittites uh, and the Luvians, and of course, obviously other groups. Does that make sense? So this is, this is the migration pattern. So they are known uh, as the group A. Uh, the next group is, or type A, that next group is type C. What happened to B? I don't know. No, type, type, type B is not as important for our conversation. Uh, that's more of the east, eastern kitties further, like in China. So, okay, so let's get to type C. Okay, the type C, these African cats were domesticated in Egypt, but um, where they came from appears to be further to the south. They appear to arrive uh, uh, from the southern regions, uh, from the desert, they are, you know, cats are desert creatures. They are, they really are, at least, at least these cats, right? Uh, so, so that's why they like to uh, do their special thing in what? What do you have ready for them? Uh, yeah, sand, right? They want to, and they naturally want to bury that, uh, what they leave behind, uh, because they don't want anybody catching the scent. Uh, and, and of course, obviously, they're descending uh, from the larger felines, right? You know, you know got lions and other kinds, tigers, and bears don't mind. No, wait, that's another. Anyway, but the whole point is, is that, is that there's this, they're smaller. That means that they'll have, they're faster in many ways. Well, gee, is fast, but they're agile, but they can hide quickly in the desert and go various places because they have less body for them to be fed and so forth. Does that make sense? So there you have it. Well, they get, get into uh, Egypt, and uh, it turns out uh, they also are hunting mice and rats. And what's interesting here is, is that these kitties, the Egyptian kitties, turn out to be friendlier. These are the friendlier kitties. Uh, now, the question is, uh, are they friendly because we help make them friendly? 
or were there just naturally uh, more harmonious uh, to uh, being with us? I don't know, but uh, it turned out that uh, maybe eating just simply mice uh, and eating uh, various other kinds of rodents and eating snakes. I gotta tell you, these cats attacked and ate snakes, which makes our cats look kind of wimpy, right? I mean, it's like, ah, snake meat, <laughs> yummy, right? So, so what happened is their strategy, or maybe, maybe influenced by humans, their strategy was, you know what? Maybe we can um, have a relationship here, a reciprocal relationship, you know? So you give me this, and I'll give you this. So there was definitely more of a, of a friendliness. Now, I'm not sure it's because the Egyptians were just more friendly and those other groups in the area of Anatolia were just weren't. And they just mm -hmm. saw them as, or uh, maybe, you know, it is the cats themselves, uh, a more friendlier breed. You know, it is up for many different kinds of questions. Uh, but um, most ancient cats of this, of this stripe had stripes. <laughs> Right. This is a pun. Uh, so they're striped kitties. But uh, what will happen is, is eventually uh, the, the Egyptian kitties will become also more solid as well. So stripes, and then through breeding, they'll become solid. Uh, and one, of course, one that everybody seemed to love was the black cat. The black cat comes from Egypt. Okay, That's where it comes from. And there are there have been scholars that have been arguing about this that you know because you do have black stripes, and in some cases you get uh, you know these anomalies and you get a full black cat, and there's some people because who believe because the Egyptians uh, love uh, black so much because it represents the black soil of the Nile which is very rich and productive that they started to go hey they start favoring those breeds that were black. And of course, you just do the basic uh, biology here and eventually you're gonna get all black cats. Does that make sense? So black cats are more popular. So, so basically type A, the mackerel type cat and uh, type C, uh, the striped kitty uh, and the black kitty. Is this cool? Is this fun? You gotta see, see what your, where your kitties come from? You look at them. Um, okay, so uh, what about the blotched kitty? <laughs> you know, the blotchy kitty. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you more later because I want to talk about this more in detail. But I'm going to say that Group A and Group C they do meet. Uh, what will happen is uh, Group A will cross over, as I said, into Europe, and they'll move along the coastal regions. And Group C, uh, because people keep stealing these cats and bringing aboard their vessels, like the Phoenicians, will take them to various ports all along the Mediterranean, and so. <coughs> And so what happens is cat A and cat C will mix in Europe. And they're a mixture of both. That's where you get the European kitties, right? They're a mixture of both. So if you have those kind of kitties, hey, you never know what you're going to get. You can get a friendly one. You can get an unfriendly one. Because, uh, you know, uh, you, could, you could try to homogenize the personality. But you know all too well uh, that those ancient links still continue to this day if you're a cat owner. If you're a cat owner, you know what I'm talking about, right? You, you, you get that cat and you're going, uh-oh, this is a type A. <laughs> and otherwise, this is a type C, because they, but they all amalgamate. That's why you get the blotches in the European version. Does that make sense? We won't talk about the Siamese and because that's a whole other story on the other side. Is this helpful? Mm -hmm. Right? So you kind of understand. I think it's kind of fun uh, looking at this and looking at uh, the DNA, which I have before me, but I just got to keep on going. Um, okay, so, the, so uh, still... Uh, we have to talk about, uh, so type, um, oh, wait, oh, I covered all that. That's pretty good. So uh, in the beginning, uh, cats ran about the desert and they ran about the marshes around Egypt. Marshes, I mean, think about that. This is a dream for a cat. Okay. So, so basically, as we know, uh, the Nile River, at a certain time, uh, it floods and the water rises, right? And then it starts to descend and the water had brought in, the river had brought in fresh black soil from way up, way up 
or I should say way down because the Egyptians have everything turned around, uh, way down in uh, other places around the Blue Nile and so forth. So the soil is coming forth and it's being left, uh, and the new black soil is left there and it's marshy. Well, if you know about a marsh and some of you who are watching this uh, know if you grow up around a swamp like area, there is a lot of bugs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of vermin. Uh, it is a haven for kitties. There's a lot of food going on there. Uh, so they enjoy this. You know, this is great. This attracts them. And they get all these buggy meals <laughs> uh, uh, once a year because, you know, every, you got marsh, you know, because the water descends down and it leaves back on this marshy area. And you got a lot of bugs going on there. So that's kind of what happened. Now, there's more to it. Um, what happened is, is that um, uh, this is probably a secret. And don't let the cats know about this. But uh, the secret is, is that cats are territorial. Don't tell anybody. And they mark places as their own. So, so cats, uh, while the Egyptians are creating, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, the, the uh, pre-dynastic period, the old kingdom, uh, the cats are creating their own little kingdoms all over the place. And they're claiming various fields for their own. So, you know, so this, so Hatsat's field, uh, this cat has that, Hatus, the cat has that one. And, you know, they, they, and they, there's a special preserve. Now what happens is a miracle. It's magic. They realize that when this cat, whose presence is there at your particular field, uh, is there for, for a long period of time, the food, the produce survives. They must have some kind of magic. It survives. And, you know, and, you know, Hesset, the guy next door who has his field where there's no cat, guess what happens? You know, you know, it doesn't thrive as much. It's all eaten away. It's like, wow, these cats have special magic. The, 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 the cat that has this field, um, the produce is going really well, and there's, this place has no cat, and well, you know, it's eaten up by vermin, so, right? So they think to themselves, everybody should have a cat, you know, to, to take, because that's about survival. So we have this symbiotic relationship now that's created between the cat uh, and the Egyptian, because they think it's magic. We know it's called, hey, you know, they're eating up all the buggies, rodents, and so forth, but they see them as magical creatures, or maybe they really are. So maybe it's no secret after all. Mm -hmm. So what happens? No, this has probably never happened to you. But this cat, you go out to your field, has set, he goes out to his field. And he sees the cat, you know. And, um, and so he, he walks, you know, to his house. You won't believe this. The cat follows him. Can you believe it? The cat you look at me like, okay, we, we do believe this, right? Yeah, how many out there have had a cat follow you home, right? Like, you know, like, and, and then the cat enters your house and looks so hungry and you feed the cat, right? You feed the cat. Should I pause? No, go for it. Okay. Are we okay with the video? It keeps streaming, but I think it's it. Okay, so so here's the thing is that is that you feed the cat and the cat, this is another miracle. The cat stays. It doesn't leave. In fact, it believes that your house is its territory. Wow. And then something else amazing happens. Something else. <laughs> you guys are looking at me like, what? What else happens, Dr. Reitfeld? Uh, what else happens? Uh, is the fact that um, not only uh, do they stay, but you know, there's a lot of vermin in the, in the, not only in the marshes, but in your house. You got rats in your house. You got mice in your house. You got all kinds of bugs. A lot of things carry diseases. And the next miracle is, is that if you have a cat, it turns out that you're healthier. So the good luck that came that connected to your fields now applies to your home. Wow. Are you, are you guys following me? Is, is you guys getting this? 
So natural deduction is these cats are magical. They have special powers. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that they fight even snakes. That's a big deal. That's a big bonus. Um, I have been in many places um, where, uh, and maybe some of you have been too, where uh, snakes just kind of enter your house. Uh, one time I was in Trinidad and it's like, oh, there's this poison snake and, and it's looking at me and it's under the bed, crawling under there and going, this is great. You know, and I want to have a cat around, but I don't want, I don't want, I don't want the modern cat because the modern cat will just run away. I want the ferocious Egyptian cat. I want that cat to be, you know, like to attack that, that snake and grab it. And, and there are depictions in Egyptian art of, of cats attacking these snakes, you know? And so, isn't that cool? I mean, you know, like I guess you look at your cat today and it just kind of goes, meow. It's like, well, wimp, <laughs> protect me. <laughs> Do something about it. So, so this is the glory of cats, right? Okay, so people are happier. Uh, so now everybody in Egypt uh, or anybody uh, believe that you should have a cat. It's not a question of, should I get a cat? It was, we need to get a cat. Every household should have its cat because that was considered good luck. It was considered a blessing and you got health from it. And you know what? Having described all this, of course you got health from it, right? They fought the vermin. They fought that, you know, the swampy regions where all these rodents come from. They're attacking the rodents. This is a good thing. Okay, so as a result, the cats became the helper and protector uh, of the Egyptians. And by the time we get to 1950, 1950 BCE, cats enter into a period where it was so popular, everybody basically had a cat. So domestication starts in the 3000s, but by the time uh, you get uh, to this, uh, basically it's the Middle Kingdom period. So you get through the Old Kingdom, even though the Old Kingdom does have cats, we'll talk about that. By the time you get to the Middle Kingdom, uh, the cats have moved and everybody seems to have cats. Does that make sense? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gradual, but not quite. So earlier, of course, before that, uh, it's funny because the cats were depicted even the pre-dynastic period uh, and the old kingdom as, as seeming a little bit more feral, a little bit more wild. And a lot of also the depictions show, show many of these becoming almost lion-like, so fierce, but they become uh, sweeter uh, as, as time goes on. Okay, so uh, the Egyptians were really devoted uh, to their, 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 their kitties and um, and so that means that the Egyptian word, the original Egyptian word for cat, um, I, I can't give you that, you know, the, uh, the hieroglyphics here, because I don't have this here, but I can, I can make the sound out phonetically. So what, what I will do is, is I will go as follows. Uh, it is, uh, so picture in your mind, I want you to maybe write this out. You write an M, you write an I, and you write a W. Okay, that's a name for a cat in ancient Egypt. Now, can anybody tell me, anybody say this, M-I-W? Does anyone want to volunteer? Meow. Huh? Meow. Mew? Mew? You guys hear Mew? That's right. So the cat is named after the sound it makes. Isn't that cute? Yeah, and the interesting part is, is that the word mule actually is the Egyptian infinitive for the word to see, to see. So that ba basically is when your cat goes meow, it goes meow, meow, meow. Uh, it's basically saying to see, to see, to see, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hence, the cats become the all-seeing ones. Think about that. They're the ones who see all things in your home. And you're thinking, well, where in the world would they get that, that idea? Well, look, I mean, they can see in the darkness, can't they? Mm -hmm. And then there's something else about cats. What do you notice about cats when you look at them in the dark? What happens to their eyes? They glow. They, glow. they shine. 
right? So they must have some magic and power. So they are overseeing your, why wouldn't you have a cat? Always watching against other forces because remember pestilence, right? Remember these, these rats and rodents and snakes, but all these lots of bugs are carrying diseases. And in their mind, diseases uh, were connected to demons, right? So that makes the cat fighter of demons, a fighter of illnesses, right? So for your good health, you got to have a cat because they fight the demons back. Does that make sense? The demons, demons that bring us various illnesses. You're going to look at your cat a whole different way, you know, and your cat's going to invite you to come over and rub its belly. And that will pretty much be the end of you. <laughs> Stay away from the back feet, by the way, too, because they're really front feet <laughs> and in many ways. Okay, so the felines, moving right along, we take a look here. Uh, well, we, we, okay, so um, okay, so eventually uh, they would become looked as good, good luck charms. Let's see, I'm just here. The Egyptians were very protective of their cats. Very, so everybody needs to have a cat, very protective. In fact, what happened is that ancient Egypt, going all the way to the Roman times, if one harmed a cat, either voluntarily or involuntarily, the sentence was often death. You would die if you hurt a cat. That's right. In fact, according to Diodorus Siculus, uh, as late as 60 BCE, when a Roman accidentally killed an Egyptian cat, an angry mob surrounded him, and after his arrest, they actually killed him, ignoring the pleas of the pharaoh to say, no, don't do this, don't kill him. Oh, he killed one of our cats. It's over. <laughs> oh, what do you think? Well, that's pretty serious. Okay, we take a look at the early depictions of cats, um, and um, when we look at them around uh, 1950 BCE, we do see depictions of cats as simply part of the family. Uh, the very first depiction is from 19, 1950 BCE. It depicts a domesticated cat on the back wall of a limestone tomb uh, with its long front legs, upright tail, because it's happy, the triangular head, uh, and it's staring down an approaching field rat. What a great depiction, right? You can see right away uh, its connection to fighting vermin in this uh, right here. Uh, another uh, aspect, uh, another one that dates from 1350 BCE, uh, shows uh, uh, a person fishing uh, in the marshes. Uh, his name is Neba Mom, right? Uh, with his wife and daughter. And just to the left of his right knee, there is a cat amongst the, the wild fowl. So, you know, so, so he's out there, he's fishing with his family, and he's out there with his cat. Over the centuries, the felines... Uh, begin to appear in more domestic contexts, hunting birds. Oh, you got birds, right? You know, uh, and sometimes they're shown as wearing collars. We're getting the collars starting there. By 1500 BCE, uh, <laughs> this is, by 1500 BCE, they are shown as sitting beneath the dining room table. I got, yeah, I love it. it's like, wow, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you know, out there fishing and all of a sudden they have the collars and the next second, you know, they're, 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 they they never left, right? They're still underneath the dining room table, uh, the kitchen table, wherever it is. So that happens. Uh, and then of course, there is another depiction uh, from Deer at Medina. It depicts Ipu, that's her name, with a small kitten sitting on the lap uh, while uh, a, uh, another cat sits uh, on the husband's lap. Isn't that cute? So you got, you got lap cats. <laughs> you know, matching. Everybody's got to have a lap cat. And again, they've been imprisoning us ever since. Uh, so, you know, there we have it. Uh, we're, we're stuck with them, right? In a good way. These Egyptian cats began to spread into the Mediterranean uh, and most of the old world, right? Around 1500 BCE. Uh, the Egyptians, uh, because they had cats that were very friendly, very seemed like they're tame, uh, people, everybody wanted them. Everybody wanted them. So we take a look, and it, it turns out that DNA evidence does demonstrate the fact that cats are being taken away uh, during this period of time. 
uh, and we find that the ancient DNA, uh, we find the ancient cats uh, from the, um, should I say, the Egyptian cats, we find their DNA at various uh, uh, Mediterranean ports <laughs> all around the Mediterranean. So it's like, well, here comes, here comes the, the here comes the kitties, here comes the Egyptian kitties, uh, because it will find you know skeletons of these uh, domesticated cats uh, in different pl places around 1500. And of course, uh, the Phoenicians go really crazy about these. So the Phoenicians really do uh, start to travel with these cats because you know there's lots of reasons. <coughs> the, the Egyptians too, excuse me, <coughs> because what happens is last last I checked, right? Uh, uh, boats have rats, right? Mm -hmm. They have mice. Mm -hmm. They have rodents. So what are you going to do? You take a cat aboard. And then what happens is cats uh, start to expand. They have all their kittens. And every now and then those cats get away and they hang out in the new port. And then they just start their own families from there. So this is how cats spread around the entire Mediterranean. Uh, but here's the problem uh, is that um, the Egyptians did not want their cats to be taken away. No, they didn't. They didn't want their cats to be taken away. There are cats. There are magic power. We don't want the, these different groups and the Phoenicians to take them away. So there's, lot, there's stories in ancient Egypt, it's pretty funny, where under the cloak of darkness, the enemy fleets go up the Nile River. And then they stop at various villages and they go out and they steal everybody's cats. And then they start to go back towards the sea. Don't worry, because guess who's behind them? That's right. The Egyptian Navy is there. And all of a sudden, they're chasing after <laughs> the, gay, the gay back, those cats. <laughs> That's how serious they were about their kitties. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, so they're very sacred. Uh, what happens now, eventually, uh, it, uh, the, you know, the word meal, which is so cute, uh, a new word starts to take over from North Africa uh, from Mu uh, in a later Egyptian period of time, but not all the time, because we know that both are used at the same time, uh, even in uh, to the third di uh, intermediate period, because we still have people even naming themselves after their cats. Oh, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> but, and they have the word Mu as part of the root. So we know that they still use this word, but another word <coughs> uh, started being used, and that is Kwata. It's a North African word, kwata. This word becomes very popular. And it goes, uh, it goes, of course, when you get to Italy, it goes, goes, goes from kwata to katus. And then Italian, gato. And Spanish, gato, right? The French, shat. The Swedish, kat. Uh, German, katza. And of course, the English, cat. That's right. Now, there's another word for a kitty. And the word uh, is pussy, as in pussy cat. You're wondering where in the world that came from. Well, it turns out that Bastet had a few other names. And one of the names for Bastet is Pasht. And from Pasht comes the word pussy. So we actually have a sacred name connected to Bastet. So when you talk about pussy cat, you go, oh no, this is this is good. This is, this is your, now you're making a direct connection between Bastet and your kitty. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So there it is. I've changed everything. Now all of a sudden everybody's going to be talking about, anyway, moving right along. Uh, according to the Greek historian Herodotus, when the Persians were at war, the Egyptians, uh, uh, you know, fought bravely. And this is sad. The Persians then decided, you know what? The Egyptians, we got to take them over. How are we going to do this? Oh, what are we going to do? So they grabbed a whole bunch of cats uh, and in the middle of the battlefield before the city of Palasium, they released all these cats in the middle of the battlefield. And you know what the, the Egyptians did? They surrendered, of course. We're not gonna kill a cat. And so they actually surrendered according to Herodotus. I, do I, when I say they love their cats, you know, I really meant it, you know? Now, of course, uh, Herodotus explains that if a house is on fire, the Egyptians would stand around the house in a line to make sure to keep their cats from jumping into the fire to protect them. Uh, if 
your cat died, uh, it was required by the family to shave off their eyebrows. So you had no eyebrows. Uh, and your mourning continued until your eyebrows grew back. So I guess if your eyebrows didn't grow back, well, I guess we'll be mourning a long time, right? So uh, a special period there. Uh, moving right along, uh, cats were eventually mummified uh, by the thousands. So we know that too. We'll talk more about that. In fact, uh, an area outside of Benny Hassan in 1888, an Egyptian farmer stumbled upon a cemetery reserved exclusively for cats. How many, and these cats, these mummified cats, date from 2000 to 1000 BCE. How many cats do they find? 80,000 mummified cats, 80,000. Unfortunately, the British um, uh, took all of these cats and they turned it into fertilizer, a total of 19 tons worth. And so, not awful. So the Egyptians, the, the British did that, right? Uh, taking a look here, uh, in 2012, um, you're going to have uh, people compare the mitochondrial DNA the sequences of excavated Egyptian mummies, cat mummies, excuse me, and looked at the sequences and they looked at the DNA. This is fascinating. And they realized that the DNA of the cats from ancient times have not changed to this day. The cats of Egypt today are still the ancient cats from that period of time. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that study was done, uh, put together by uh, uh, Leon uh, in Cats of the Pharaohs, genetic comparisons of Egyptian cat mummies uh, to their fellow contemporaries came out May of 2012. Isn't that interesting? So the domestic cat from Egypt to this day does not mix with the type A cat. No, because those, 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 the, the domestic cat today of Egypt is not mixed, with, mixed because that mixing happens in Europe. What the, do the, is there a resemblance? What do the Egyptian cats of today look like? Like the ones I just talked about, the small group, headed group black. small headed black, and they look just like the ones uh, from type A. Now, the question is, well, were there some cats that mixed in uh, from cat C? Because hello, you know, uh, you have Alexandria, and it's, uh, surely some of the other mixture could come in. And the point is, there just wasn't enough of them because it's still, there's so many cats there, it still became dominant. So they got lost uh, in the whole Punnett Square recessive uh does that make sense yeah. so yeah so it's still the same cats isn't are, that are there any pure type a cats still uh, yes well there is that but those those pure uh, type a cats we find them uh in the area of anatolia and going further east so yeah you do have those types yeah one last time what's what where does the latin felis come from it's not doesn't sound like any of the other word for it yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer, but I think it actually comes from the the, the words for the, the lion family. So it's a, it's a larger umbrella. Sorry, I do have an answer for that. Sorry. Okay. Does that help? All right. So moving on. Okay, so let's talk about, okay, we, we talked about cats. We kind of get the idea what they're like. I mean, you know, many of us own cats. So, wait, actually, no, actually, no, I don't think any of us own cats. Right? There's not a single one of us that own cats. They own us. That's right. We got, we got I got to make sure I get that straight right away. You know, <laughs> dogs, you know, we own dogs. Okay. You know, and they know they're, I am so old. Give me something. Right. Not all dogs, but a lot of them, but uh, cats, no, no, no. They're very, infant. okay. So anyway, by the time of the unification of upper and lower Egypt, the Egyptians were already worshiping various animals, including cats. Uh, but we can find from the archeological record, uh, cats were not yet uh, domesticated during the time of the old kingdom or the pre-dynastic period, but there is a early cat goddess or kind of like lion cat goddess, and the name is Moftet. Let's talk about Moftet. Moftet, uh, early dynastic period, uh, uh, 3150 to 2686 BCE. Uh, this particular Moftet, uh, resembles a feline, a lynx, uh, a cheetah, sometimes a mongoose, right? When she appears with the animal head, Moftet was the goddess who protects one against, guess what? Snakes and scorpions. Once again, we're back to the whole idea of these vermin. Uh, both, of course, hang around the swamp-like areas. When she is depicted with a human head, 
she sometimes has braided hair that in turn becomes scorpion tails at the end. Isn't that interesting? So she has braided hair and then scorpion tails uh, that are at the very end of it. Moftet was invoked in rituals intended to help those suffering from both uh, snake bites and scorpion stings. Uh, and, you know, so believed to have these magical powers. And uh, the cat receives this great attribution. Uh, she was known as the slayer of serpents. <laughs> A serpent slayer, isn't that cute? All right. Uh, in public context, Moftet is associated also with the idea of legal justice, often related specifically to um, the idea of execution. What? Execution. Now, I think it's interesting here. <laughs> so uh, what will happen, it, sometimes her cat-like body is shown as climbing up the executioner's staff. You know, so she is connected. With, and uh, Moftet actually uh, is believed to rip out the hearts of those who deserve death and cast them before the Pharaoh's feet so that they may please him by their show of justice. <laughs> yeah. So you can picture cats doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So so basically, you know, you know, so the cat, you know, cats rips up the heart, you know, and it just takes the heart and, and brings it to the Pharaoh and, and drops it there. Much like, of course, many of your cats do the same thing with, with mice, you know, they give the little offering there. Cats are already giving offerings there, but in this case, supposedly of the heart, in the case mm -hmm. of Moff Det, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Moff Det actually means she who runs. It's feminine. Obviously, it's a goddess. Uh, giving her the nickname, the runner, because she's known to run about quickly, back and forth, which, of course, we experience also many times uh, in the household, uh, usually around, you know, four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I still laugh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Moff Det was very violent when it came to execution. It is said that uh, she had these very sharp claws and she, you know, before she tears out your heart, she takes her claws and she boom, crosses it over your neck and slashes it. So, you know, she kills you with her claws, the juggler vein. So there you go. All right. So execution. Yeah. All right. So uh, she's popular in that sense. Uh, the Pharaoh by the name of Den um, during this pre dynastic period, really, really liked her quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, he kept setting up statues of Moff Det. Uh, the coffin texts, excuse me, the pyramid texts also talk about uh, Moff Det uh, and her magical appearances. By the time, however, we get to the middle and then to the New Kingdom period, Moff Det's overall role was greatly diminished, uh, but she still was believed to be uh, the ruler over the judgment hall of Duat with her sharp claws able to decapitate all those considered enemies of Egypt. So she basically went uh, from tearing out your heart uh, to cutting off your head, but in the underworld. So there's like a little change there. So that's Moff Det. And then eventually, of course, as Moff Det faded, you have another uh, deity that starts to rise. And that deity is known as Bast, also known as Bastet, uh, deity of motherhood, protection, and fertility. Uh, and what happens is, is that uh, during the early period of time, she was very much a goddess of war. Did you know Bast was, Bas was a goddess of war in Lower Egypt? And connected, and of course, this is the Nile Delta region, which is very marshy. Uh, she had lion-like attributes at first and only gradually became the well-known goddess of protection, which became her uh, dominant personality by the time we get towards the end of the New Kingdom. And by the time we get to the 22nd dynasty, 945 to 915, uh, she was represented as a lady with a cat head. <laughs> so, and she becomes very domesticated in so many different ways. Okay, uh, now what is interesting here the name uh, of the goddess remains uncertain. The word bust means. Uh, one, of course, uh, recent one, and it's still, I, I checked uh, just today to make sure. Uh, recent one is that 
it's she of the ointment jar. She of the ointment jar. And of course, uh, the reason is, is that her name resembles the hieroglyph for ointment jar. Her name resembles the same hieroglyph. And she was also associated with protective ointments. So protection. Well, where are they getting this from? Once again, uh, this idea, you're going to have this with Moffdet too. But what happens is that uh, she's, again, curative of any kind of snake bites or different kinds of stings. You can see where ointments would be used. And so she is, that, in a sense, that ointment to give uh, healing. Now, I did look this up. I made sure because you're going you're gonna to have your jaw drop open. Uh, here it is is that uh, the name, uh, this name, Bastet, because it's connected to the idea of ointment jar, travels into the Greek world. This travels into the Greek world in, in connection to ointment jar. Here we go. And becomes, and there's a certain kind of a stone that's used to be used for ointment jars. It is known as this is not hearsay, known as alabaster. And the word bost is still in there. So isn't that interesting? It's alabaster jar. Uh, it, the word bost is a major part of that. Uh, and it does come from an Egyptian word where it's el bostus. So there is, it, there is a direct correlation. It just gets transliterated to Greek. And then, of course, gets connected to that idea. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you know? So they were looking at it and go, wow, oh, bost? gets everywhere, right? And the pussy and alabaster and wow, we're going pretty well here. Okay, so um, one of the earliest references to Bost uh, is uh, from a fragment of an early uh, dynastic stone vessel. Uh, and um, the object is made of two sherds uh, joined together. Uh, and you see here, um, there is the name of the lion, later goddess Bastet is rather common. And the name, it does appear on this particular stone jar, but we don't know what the context is. We just know it's, it's there, right? So that's the, one of the earliest references to that. And that's, again, early uh, dynastic period, 3150 to 2686 stone vessel. We move on. Uh, one thing we can be sure about, however, Bost uh, at this date was a lion goddess rather than a cat goddess a lion goddess rather than a cat goddess. Well, then we get to the Old Kingdom, uh, 2686 to 2181. Uh, Bost was one of the goddesses protecting the pharaohs. Uh, she was declared as Lady of the Flame. I love these names. Lady of the Flame, because she was also protective of Ra as well. And there is a story. And the story goes with Ra is that Bost was depicted as fighting the evil snake by the name of Apep, who's the enemy of, 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 of Ra. And so as Ra, you know, as he goes through the dome of heaven and goes down into the horizon, he goes into the underworld on his night barge, right? Night bark. And what happens is that he's going to encounter uh, this ferocious, evil Apep, uh, who's known as the great evil serpent of old. But uh, the story goes is that when he goes in the underworld, Bost was there. It's because this early serpent of old is a serpent. It's a snake. So who best to fight against a snake? A cat. So what happens is lion cat. So what happens is Bost, he fights against a pep. He protects Ra, who is the, the sun god, and Apep, the great serpent of old, the great snake, uh, the primordial snake is defeated, and yay, and Ra rises again the next day in the morning. So now, I mean, that's a hero, right? It's a hero kitty, right? So, so Bost, at this point, was believed to make evil spirits flee by her very presence. I like that. But... Because she's so protective of Pharaoh and protective of Ra, more and more she goes uh, from the offensive to the defensive. She's going to be protective. 
nurturing. Are you seeing how this works? And so gradually she is understood as a protective mother. Uh, and so um, I see you have this uh, in the old kingdom. Bast is described as the deceased king's nurse, which is interesting in the underworld, right? By the middle kingdom, coffin texts have a Bast as depicted as protecting the deceased. So it's going from the protecting the Pharaoh and go, go to protecting the people in general. And eventually Bast uh, uh, becomes, moves up, especially when Thebes became the capital city of Egypt, of uh, the new kingdom. Uh, so that's 1550 to 1077 BCE. During this time, uh, Bast becomes even more popular and uh, starts to become known as Bastet. So it moves from, so that means during the time of the pre-dynastic period, uh, during the old kingdom, during the middle kingdom, uh, uh, it's Bast. It's not Bastet. When we get to the new kingdom, it starts to move to Bastet. You guys got that? So there's a gradual change. Uh, some people say that the added suffix diminished her status in many ways, you know, you know, it makes it cuter, right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, but that's a little bit of controversy right there. Uh, by the new kingdom, she was associated with lavish jars and she became the protector uh, of, of, of these ointments, but she also became known as the goddess of the perfumes. Now we're moving from, from just simply ointments to help you heal to ointments that make you smell good, right? Mm -hmm. So you see, again, the gradual evolution of ideas. I love that when you can trace these ideas and how they come about, right? So she's, they declare her as the perfumed protector. That's actually the, the perfume. <laughs> Watch, oh, she smells pretty good. What happens, of course, is at this point, her fierce lion-like traits during this new kingdom period of time, everything is transferred over to another kitty goddess or cat goddess or lion goddess by the name of Sekhmet. So that's where that transition happens, right? So the fierce aspects of, of Bast uh, switches over to Sekhmet and then she becomes Bastet. Does that make sense? You guys got that? So the gradual change is going on there. Uh, but the idea is that two are important because they're both, one is domestic and one is, one is not domesticated and they both uh, provide an important function. Bast did not fade away in popularity uh, for what will happen here, and this is, becomes even more fun, is we get now to the third intermediate period. Uh, that is uh, 1069 to 664. Uh, what will happen uh, is, that, um, is that she, her cult, is even further enhanced. Even though she's diminished to a certain extent, people love her even more. How more? Oh, you're going to love this. If you like, like talking about kitties. So we're, there's a pharaoh by the name of Shoshank I during the third intermediate period. He reigned from 943 to 922 BCE. And he decided to elevate the cult of Bast or Bastet by establishing an entire city dedicated to her worship. An entire city. And this city was known as Bubastis. Yes, and of course, the name means House of Bast. It was located southwest of Tanis, or Tanis, as you say in American English, Tanis, right? You know, it's like, it's like the Amsterdam and Amsterdam, right? You know, that's why I say Bast, because it's not Bast. <laughs> I know, I'm ruining everybody's day, right? Because it's a Bast, ah, ah, so. Okay, moving right along, kitty scrolling so what happened by the way the this this the, the, the shoshek is connected to the same as shyshek that you hear about in the bible you guys ever heard of this you know so shyshek is talked about who invades judah you mentioned the first kings and chronicles right he invaded judah and took away the great treasures uh from jerusalem and the reason why you should be like going hey i know what this is about you guys ever heard of Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Mm -hmm. Remember they go to Tannis, mm -hmm. you know, because they think the Lost Ark is there. Well, that's that same Shyshak. That same Shyshak is the same guy uh, that created this whole city for kitties. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, there you have it. There's the connection. Well, uh, this city thrives 
uh, during uh, his reign and uh, basically all the way to the Roman period, all the way. And what I like about this is that, is that the name Bastet uh, appears, uh, and even the word Mio appears in various names of that dynasty. So they, they bring it up. Uh, there's, there's one um, of the, uh, the pharaohs known as Pami, uh, which simply means the cat or he who belongs to the cat. And there's a, there's a pharaoh that's known as he who belongs to the cat. So when I'm saying that it's a big deal, it is a, a big deal. Well, the city of Bubastis um, uh, did exist before. It did. Uh, it exists as early as the early dynastic period. Uh, and so the city was rededicated, in a sense, uh, to these, these kitties. Herodotus uh, describes the city of Bubastis. Uh, he says as follows, except at the entrance, it is surrounded by water, for two canals branch off from the river and run as far as the entrance to the temple. Yet neither canal mingles with the other, but one runs on this side and the other on that. Each canal is 100 feet wide and its banks are lined with trees. The propelia, that's at the entrance, are 60 feet in height and are adorned with sculptures, uh, nine feet high and of excellent workmanship. And he continues, the temple of Bast, being in the middle of the city, is looked down upon from all sides as you walk around. And this comes from the city having been raised, whereas the temple itself has not been moved, but remains in its original place. Quite around the temple, there goes a wall adorned with sculptures. Within the enclosure is a grove of fair tall trees planted around a large building in which an effigy of Bost is connected. So you have an effigy of Bost. There it is. Um, and it, and it, it goes on. This is a pretty remarkable, pretty large city, as you can hear. Okay, and... Uh, what will happen is, is that the city, this temple of Bastet, uh, it was built from red granite. Some of the blocks have been found. There are remnants of it. So if you're interested in kitties, you guys want to make a, <coughs> you want to go for a pilgrimage, uh, this would be a place to go, right? Go to Bubastis. It's built from red granite. Some of the blocks found in the structure indicate that it was probably constructed at first in the old kingdom uh, and then additions during Ramses II. There's a hoard of, of gold and silver vessels that were found there. Uh, taking a look at it, uh, the scholars disagree as whether the hall of columns had a ceiling or it was open-ended. Uh, we know that there's Hathor-headed uh, capitals and they have found the goddess shrine, the inner sanctum or the nous of this temple, uh, which was carved from a single piece of red granite, approximately 12 feet high and five feet wide. And the image would have been located within this. It's a pretty large image of Bastet. Uh, it, would have, it was laid, overlaid with gold uh, and um, with precious stones, turquoise and lapis lazuli. And the priests went to uh, her statue and they, 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 what they did is they woke it up in the morning. Uh, they, they changed its clothes uh, and after, after washing it. Uh, and then attended it all during the day with prayers. And then, of course, they did the close-up rituals. Um, so interesting bits and pieces here. Uh, we find also everywhere ointment jars and perfume bottles. I mean, there's everywhere throughout the town. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, and now uh, another purpose comes about, ointment jars for, for obviously for uh, healing ointment jars obviously connected to other perfumes, but also ointment jars connected to now burial, funerary practices now. So Bosque Bas is connected to that. So now the temple, the temple itself uh, was not only filled with cats, the entire city was filled with cats. Cats were everywhere about the city. In fact, they had a, they had a cat problem after a while. So in addition, we have found thousands of images of bronze and amulets of bust, as well as other depictions of the cat throughout the whole city. Uh, there's one, a popular one is an image of a mother cat with her kittens and was sold to women wishing to get pregnant. So if you're wishing to get pregnant, now there's something really cute to this. <laughs> okay, so it's been determined that uh, how many 
children you want is how many kittens that appear on the special image you give to her. So if you want one kid, you got one kitten with the mama. If you want two kids, you got two kittens. If you want three, are you guys getting that? Also, it was traditional, even uh, after, during, you know, when you get married uh, in ancient Egypt, it was also traditional for you to give these, give these as gifts, as wedding gifts, you know, so for good luck uh, in uh, being productive. Because, you know, cats are a little bit, how do you say this? Prolific? Is that the word I'm looking for? <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> but the population became a little too big. And so now we got a problem. You're going, I know you're not going to like hearing this, but this is talked about in ancient times. When you got too many cats, uh, it becomes a health situation. So they did do uh, ritual sacrifice of, of, of kittens when they were when there's too many. So they want to have cats all over the place, cats all throughout the city, but they became too many uh, and there's not enough to feed them all. They had to control the population this way. They really didn't have much choice. And then they mummified these, ki these, these cats. And these, these cat mummies were actually sold to people for good luck. So the idea that it was believed that there's still, still such good luck. And so there you have it. Now, uh, I'll just tell you the story. So, so, so we, we find all these cat mummies and, you know, they're supposed to, uh, they're supposed to, uh, you know, take the cat. And apparently some people didn't have the heart to do it. I, can, I get it, right? So, so, they're, they're, so they excavate, they excavate, they find these cat mummies and they look inside and they just find a few bones that are sprinkled about amongst the other mummies of cats. And in some cases, it's all filled with nothing. So, so supposedly, and so you could see probably the priest is going, oh, I just can't do this. <laughs> it's like <laughs> filling the mummy up uh, with something else and selling that, you know, this is good luck. Yeah, wink, wink. So, so it, it shows that there's this moment of, uh, I don't think, you know, all, obviously there's another way of reading the information. You could also look at this as I want to make a profit. We ran out of the cats. But I don't think that's possible because they have too many cats. Does that make sense? There's too many cats. That's the problem. There's too many cats. So it seems like more the other. Okay, so moving right along, uh, there is also uh, a, a, a feast dedicated to Bast. Isn't that great? And I'm going to go ahead and tell you about the feast. Why don't we do that, right? So there's an annual festival of Bast, <clears throat> a major event in Egypt. Herodotus records it. Here it goes. Barges and river craft of every uh, description, filled with men and women, floated leisurely down the Nile. I'm reading the account from that time, by the way. The men played on pipes of lotus, the women on cymbals and tambourines, and such as had no instrument accompanied the music with clapping hands and dances and other joyous gestures. Thus did they while on the river, but when they came to a town on its banks, the barges were made fast, uh, and the pilgrims disembarked, and the women sang, playfully mocked the women of the town and threw their clothes over their head. <laughs> That's quite a festival, right? Okay. Uh, when, they, when they reached Bubastis, they then held a wonderfully solemn feast, and more wine of the grape was consumed in those days than all the rest of the year. Such was the manner of this festival, and it is said that as many as 700,000 pilgrims have been known to celebrate the Feast of Bost at the same time. Yeah. So one wonders, you know, if they're already drunk by the time they're throwing their clothes at the other women and mocking them, uh, probably having a lot of wine uh, on the trip down. So what do you think, right? <laughs> uh, so there you have it. Uh, we get to the, uh, so that's, that, so Bubastis. Well, we get to the late period. 664 to 332, uh, we find, of course, more images. One bronze votive statuette of a nursing cat and her litter. In fact, we're going to see uh, even into the 300s, uh, what's really a popular theme is, is Bastet as being nurturing, as being loving, and taking care of kittens. So that is the context that we see. Um, oh, there's just, so, there's so many cute things. I, I wish I could read all this, you know? Um, uh, yeah, so, but there's also this limestone figure of a sleeping woman uh, and a pair of seated felines decorating the footboard of her bed. Uh, cat imagery was very popular. It's very, just a cute image. 
Uh, Bestet was tremendously popular and many images and amulets of her were produced, uh, in, worn as by worshipers as amulets or dedicated at temples as offerings. Uh, so you have this, um, uh, yeah, pilgrims visited Egyptian temples could dedicate small bronze statuettes of cats uh, representing Bast as we know. Uh, we also see that sometimes uh, they like making their kitties wear jewelry. I know. So, so, so they have like the, they have the gold nose ring, and they go, "This is cute," you know. And they have the, they have the, they pierce their ears, and it's like, well, that's what they do, you know. They just they, they love their cats. So there you have it. Um, uh, so moving right along. Um, so what will happen is during the late period, the all-seeing eye to ward off thieves. Uh, she's still known as that. Uh, connected to the all-seeing eye as well. Uh, there's other stories there, but I'm kind of running out of time a little bit. I want to make sure uh, we get uh, to the next cat. Uh, but is this good, right? You guys feel good about Bast, Bastet, you know, happy about that? Okay, let's start. It's just time to be unhappy. No, just kidding. No, no, it's, 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 it's an interesting kitty. This is an interesting cat, but it's pretty scary. This is a scary one. This is Sekhmet. Sekhmet is... Um, is a warrior goddess as well as the goddess of healing. The word Sekhem means power or might uh, and can be translated as the one who is powerful and mighty. Uh, she is also given titles such as the one before whom evil trembles, mistress of dread, lady of slaughter, and she who mauls. <laughs> so she is a really, you know, she's depicted as a lioness, uh, being the fiercest of hunters. Sekhmet is represented in many ways. Um, uh, sometimes she has a head of a lion upon a female body. Typically, Sekhmet wears red, intended to represent the blood which she, uh, which she uh, often sheds in search of justice. So are you feel a little moffdet kind of moving into Sekhmet. And you, there's kind of the same feel going on there. And some scholars say, well, yeah, so when moffdet started to fade, Sekhmet took over at the same time Sekhmet took the fierce aspects of Bost who became Bostet and combined it together. Does that make sense? So there's, there's a gradual evolution. Uh, Seated statues of Sekhmet often show her holding the Ankh of life, but when she is uh, shown striding or standing, she is usually holding a scepter formed from papyrus, which is a symbol of lower Egypt. Uh, it was said that her breath formed the desert. In fact, Sekhmet was represented by the searing heat, the searing heat of the midday sun. Uh, so she is pretty fierce. She's also known as the Lady of Pestilence, the Red Lady, uh, because she it's thought that she could send plagues against those who anger her, which I think is interesting because, uh, you know, what you had uh, with, with Bast is, you know, you keep us away from pestilence. Segment is going, no, no, I'm going to give you pestilence. However, uh, you have this idea that some cases uh, her plagues fight against other plagues. So it's like, you know, so, so her plagues will defeat the other plagues going about. And there is that perspective as well. Segment uh, is known to have special arrows, uh, oftentimes seven in numbers, uh, and her striking power. Uh, is known as being called a knife. It's also striking power is known as this burning flame, right? So there you have it. Um, Sekhmet is also often mentioned as fighting demons, but also is mentioned as having demons as part of her retinue, part of her assembly. So, so she not only fights against demons, she has demons on who she welds these powers. So she fights, so she does pestilence, she has demons. And remember ancient world, pestilence and demons are connected together, right? So that's why you have this connection. Uh, so there it is. And she gets pretty upset if you mess up her rituals. Uh, okay, so we keep going. <laughs> uh, oh boy, here we go. Okay, so we're gonna keep going into this one. Um, she's viewed as a solar deity who is sometimes understood as the daughter of Ra uh, and in many aspects uh, connected to Hathor, who also Ra's daughter, 
when associated with the Eye of Ra. Now she's connected to this Eye of Ra, which is a searing power that comes from Ra. So Ra, uh, basically, uh, when Ra gets angry, right, in many cases, uh, he does have his eye, and his eye, when turned into fire, is Sekhmet manifest, right? So that fire. Also, what's, which is interesting, is Hathor, who's connected to Ra, connects also to the eye of Ra, and when she has that power, then Hathor turns into Sekhmet too, through the power of the flame that burns all things. Does that make sense? So the eye of Ra is very important. Sekhmet was also known as the protector of borders uh, in many cases. Um, okay, so there is one, there's one story and then we'll go on to one more because we, we have one more. I, I'm not gonna end here. Why would I do that? So as I said, the, as Ra's daughter, Hathor was viewed as the eye of Ra, the feminine aspect of the male god and representing as the disc of the sun. If Ra is attacked or opposed, the eye of Ra will respond and attack or oppose accordingly uh, and, uh, and create this disorder. So when angered, Hathor's heat as the eye of Ra will blaze out and scorch or even completely burn those who are objects of her wrath. And there is one story uh, dating from the New Kingdom where Ra directs his eye against those who sought to rebel against him. And so Hathor manifests herself as the goddess Sekhmet and begins to massacre everybody. But then she goes out of control. She goes crazy in a very much like Kali the goddess goes crazy and she becomes drunk with the blood of those who oppose her and so she won't stop the bloodbath and, and and so they feared that all humanity would be slaughtered because deep down inside according to egyptians we all oppose the justice of raw at some point of our life and because of that, we deserve death. So she's going crazy to, the, to the, the point where to stop the bloodbath, Ra dyes some beer red so that looks like blood and poured it all over the land. And then when she drank of it, uh, she passed out and that quelled the situation. <laughs> so that took care of it. So there you have it. So um, to pacify Sekhmet then, at the, they celebrated a, a, a festival at the end of the battle. Uh, so that uh, that would placate her, and it's called the Festival of Intoxication. <laughs> the Egyptians, during this festival segment, they danced, they played music to soothe the wildness of the goddess and drank great quantities of wine uh, in a ritual sense to imitate the extreme drunkenness that stopped the wrath of the goddess. So, so this idea is you get to the festival and you get plastered. You get as drunk as possible, and hopefully that drunkness, that image, that you know, acting out that drunkness would placate uh, Sekhmet and make sure that uh, she kind of holds off on that fire of the eye of Ra. Right. So uh, during this festival, a statue of Sekhmet was dressed in red, facing west, while Bast was dressed in green, facing east, because you need to have balance. So this is where Boss goes and tries to balance out Sekhmet. Does that make sense? This is what the Egyptians used to do. And this was, of course, connected uh, to their New Year's festival. That's how you bring it in, right? Uh, you know, so there you have it. Uh, there's a lot of information on this, but uh, I'll just keep on going. This is it helpful, right? You guys understand how this works? Okay, so you got these fierce lions, like, and let's move on. And here we go. There's one more I want to talk about. Uh, I like this particular uh, goddess. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that Sekhmet and Mut also start to merge together at a certain point. One more thing. Uh, and who is who is obviously uh, the wife of Amon-Ra. They start to, and it's interesting because at a certain point, uh, Sekhmet is, merges with Mut, who is, who is the wife of Amon or Amon-Ra, and she becomes an aspect of it to the point where 
they will say mut sekmet, mut sekmet. And that's how she slowly disappears. And so she becomes an aspect of the great goddess who is paired with Amun. Does that make sense? So that's how, that's how she starts to fade away a little bit. Okay, so you have many, and Mut is all throughout this. Okay, so here it is. Uh, here. So you may ever hatch upset. This is the best place. I love this. This is going to be our, my wonderful, fun, fun conclusion here. Hatch upset, you know, she was a famous female pharaoh. Very, you know, of Egypt during the, the New Kingdom. And what she did, same place Beni Hassan, sounds familiar, right? We're getting used to this place with all the mummies, right? Uh, Look at Upper Egypt. Uh, it's 152 miles south of Cairo. Hatshepsut, uh, who ruled from 1478 to 1458 of the New Kingdom, built an underground temple dedicated to a goddess by the name of Paquet. Paquet, who is a fusion between Sekhmet of e Upper Egypt and Bast of Lower Egypt. She's a combination, again, between Sekhmet of Upper Egypt and Bast of Lower Egypt. In a sense, Paquet was a cultural compromise between these two well-revered uh, feline goddesses. Paquette was not as ferocious as Sekhmet, but not as domesticated as Bastet. She is stands in between. Uh, Paquette means she who snatches or who tears. Uh, you I'm right here, a Paquette, a coffin text declares, oh, you of the dawn who wake and sleep, Oh, you who are lipness, doing aforetime in Nidet, I have appeared as Paquet the Great, whose eyes are keen and whose claws are sharp, the lioness who sees and catches by night. So she is this in between. Uh, sometimes she's depicted as a wildcat or desert lynx hunting her prey by night, but she's always alert of the slightest movement under her watchful eye. And she sits and she watches and she observes. You never know when she's gonna get at you. So you gotta be careful. Isn't that just like a kitty though? Isn't that right? The kitties do that, you can yeah. see that. You know, sitting there watching you and you're bothering them. And all of a sudden they get look kind of, there's this face. You know, something crosses over their eyes and all of a sudden it's like, and you keep doing these things like, like uh oh, and then it kind of hoes down, and then it does like the golf butt, you know, <laughs> right? You know, we're getting ready to like, oh, leap at you, right? That's pretty much right. Uh, what Bastet is, you know, she she is a she is more sneaky, right? So while while you know, uh, segment is rah, all at you at once, there's no question about it. Uh, and when Bast is more like, oh, let's take care of you, uh, Pocket is like. We'll just see, we'll just watch and see how things go. I could be nice to you and I may not be nice to you. It's my mind to make up. Pocket uh, is, uh, she is shown either with her claws wrapped about a snake or another prey of some kind or standing over them in a victorious posture, right? Pocket was the protectress, a fierce protectress of specifically mothers. She protects mothers. So while Bost is nurturing in many ways, what happens is Paquette is more, uh, you know, she's more, more uh, protective in an offensive way, right? Paquette was <clears throat> a regional goddess who is often called the goddess of the mouth of the wadi, or she who opens the ways of the stormy rains, because the region where she originated is covered by narrow valleys called wadis. Uh, these, of course, are, 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 are you know, grooves that are in the hills, right? They're, and so that when it rains a lot, suddenly, you know, they flood and become rivers. And isn't that just like Paquette, right? You know, it, it look harmless, these riverbeds that come from uh, the, the dry riverbeds that come from these hills, and all of a sudden it rains and rushing water. So you never know when she's going to flood. 
And of course, these areas are known for torrential floods. Uh, Paquette also is declared as Weret Aku, which means she who has great magic. So she's very magical in many ways. Uh, the temple, by the way, consists of great underground complex of passageways and grand chambers. Um, the catacombs of the temple, a pocket, are filled with mummified cats everywhere to be found. Uh, and of course, I actually have more here uh, that are more inscriptions. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, uh, so uh, let's see, here's the dedication. Hatshepsut uh, writes as follows about her. Uh, Paquette the Great, who traverses the valleys in the midst of the Eastland, whose ways are storm beaten, I made her temple with which was due to her Aeneid of gods. The doors were of acacia wood fitted with bronze at the seasons. The priests knew this. Her city I made divine. Uh, their temples furnished with which comes forth. The offering table has wrought with silver and gold, chests of linen, every vessel that abides in this place. Uh, so this is, you can see, uh, and you, this is interesting, uh, even though there's multiple female pharaohs uh, of Egypt, there was, that's a whole nother talk. Hatshepsut has a lot of significance because she was known to be so powerful. And I think it's interesting, one of the first things she does with her power is to combine Sekhmet and Bastet and create her own goddess that seems from her perspective to fit more needs of women, specifically not just childbirth, but other areas. And then what she does is she's the high, she's the high priestess. And when, even before she became full Pharaoh, because you know, at first uh, she's reigning with her son, before she became for, full Pharaoh, uh, what happens is that uh, she was high priestess, but when that ended and she had sole rule, what did she do? She made her daughter as the high priestess and made her as a dedicant. So this was very important, uh, you know, and the course again shows the power of women uh, within ancient Egypt. So her daughter was Neferer, uh, and uh, there you have it. Of course, I just kind of give you the, the summary of all what I just mentioned. Uh, later on, uh, the Greeks started viewing Bastet uh, as, uh, as Artemis. So what will happen is the site uh, founded um, uh, uh, by her, um, uh, by Hatshepsut becomes sacred. Uh, in fact, uh, it's known as the cave of Artemis by the Greeks. So it's pretty cool. So there's a, there's a standing temple, but there's an underground temple that goes several levels down and there's catacombs. And guess what? This would be another great place. In fact, uh, I have here in my talk alone, a whole bunch of interesting pilgrimage sites you could go to. And I think, wouldn't that be fun uh, to have uh, an Egyptian uh, trip, uh, you know, going, going to Egypt and visiting all the places sacred to kitties, to the cats? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be fun, you know, focusing on that, uh, going to Bubastis uh, and going uh, to a Hatshepsut and other places besides that? And of course, there's also another... A uh, cat god by the name of Ma'al. <laughs> Ma'al, <laughs> love it. Uh, uh, pronounced M A U and an A A. Uh, this one, of course, uh, uh, when we lose uh, the one cat goddess connected to Ra, uh, they just replace it with another. Because, you know, somebody's still got to protect Ra, and it gives it the affectionate name Ma'a. So there you have it. And, and also, uh, even uh, even Bess, the goddess Bess, sometimes is depicted as female and is known as a protector of children. So that's another little interesting little bit of trivia. So, so what will happen uh, is the reverence that the Egyptians had for these cats did translate pretty easily over into their reverence uh, to these cat deities. And the worship of them continued from uh, into the Roman period and when did, it, when did it end? Well, your kitties will claim it never ended, right? You have these stories, right? These rumors uh, that, you know, every now and then you see a group of cats together and you go, you approach them, they all disappear, you know, and they're talking about the fact that we're still in charge and, and maybe they are. Uh, yeah. But when it comes to Bost or Bostet and these others, uh, unfortunately, uh, that ends with, with, the, with the Christian era. So 
uh, during the time of the 300s uh, into the 400s with the closures of the temples uh, throughout Egypt. Uh, these, these images were looked down upon. Uh, there's, there's, in fact, in many cases, there are signs that they were attacked. Uh, these, these images of, of, of Bastet or Sekhmet uh, or, or taken off their heads and looked at as atrocities. And unfortunately, you're going to have even early uh, Christian ascetics seeing these as demons, as, as monsters of all different kinds of sorts. And so this worship uh, eventually uh, faded away. However, having said that, I do know of a few stories uh, written by Christians uh, during this time who still looked at kitties as something special, uh, something to be loved. And there were monasteries that were filled with cats. So apparently, even though they disassociated themselves with these cat deities, the love of kitties do continue on, uh, at least for a long, a long time uh, in Egypt, uh, even during the, uh, the Coptic period and going into the Islamic era. So we have covered cats. What do you guys feel, right? What do you guys think? Did you guys enjoy yourselves, right? Right? Thank you so much. I'll take my usual picture of people, because that's what I do. And then I'll open myself up for questions. Get your good side. OK, so, so here we go. So say cat. I, didn't, I don't know why the, the flash didn't go off. Let's see here, I'll do this again. Uh, or what, what do you want to turn on the, let's see here. I guess you want to turn on, okay, I'll do that. Okay, all right, let's see over here. Let's see here. All right, uh oh, <laughs> here we go. Okay. And there we go. Oh, Terry, you got the, the, the light behind you there. There we go. All right. Okay, so. Questions, right? Uh, oh, I got a couple. Uh, so I know you mentioned like uh, the change of Telfox, the box sets, the stuff like that. Is some people might think it was taking away power. To me, hearing it, it sounds like similar to more of the Egyptian pharaoh's name, mm -hmm. uh, the way they ended. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that it could have like been more empowering? Well, and, and that's a good question. Some people understand as you know the suffix ended. Uh, as as an, almost like an endearment aspect. The question, of course, is is the adding of of, of, the, of the suffix at the end is going to be I'm just redundant. By the way, I just said that um, uh, would, in a sense, was meant to empower uh, Bost as Bostet. Uh, and uh, a lot of the the uh, the sources I looked at from scholars say that it was meant to make it less. However, having said that, I understand that. He did have that aspect where it came, came to pharaohs by adding in uh, the extra, that extra, that suffix. At the same time, hello, after it becomes, uh, she becomes Bostet, you got an entire city named after her called Bubastis. And I don't know, that to me sounds like, it seems like she's becoming even more popular than ever. But I think what's happening is she's more popular than ever, but she moves from, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, ointments, uh, that are, are connected uh, to heal, healing, ointments are, to, ointments are connected to perfume. And so there's that, in a sense, and she moves also from uh, a ferocious lion goddess uh, to a more of a domesticated goddess as time goes on. The nurturing aspect. Yeah, she has no nurturing aspect uh, during the pre-dynastic period or the old kingdom. And even the middle kingdom is a little fuzzy. By the time we get to the new kingdom, she's very nurturing. And that goes into the third intermediate period, and of course after that. So it's all how you look at the addition of the suffix. It could be uh, it's 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 demoting, or it could be that she's becoming so endearing. Doesn't mean that we love her any less. In fact, maybe it, the opposite could be said. We love her so much she's even more powerful to us because she's a, she's important for our life. Now you got to remember uh, when you're if you're Egyptian and you're coming home. Uh, you're coming home to your cat, you know? And so you want to feel that that cat is powerful. You want to feel that that cat can protect you, that it can protect you from illnesses and disease. And, and this added aspect of protecting uh, you in, in, you know, in different kinds of states, uh, I think that um, that could be comforting. So, so certainly more endearing and how we view that as powerful or less powerful. I think in our society today, if we think of it, 
as nurturing, we feel like it is less powerful. And maybe that's, that, that, I don't think that's right. I think that, you know, nurturing is a powerful thing. And I think that's, uh, and I don't think that's even an age, a, a modern notion, excuse me. I think it's an ancient notion. I think that idea actually bothered Hatshepsut. Because I mean, Hatshepsut's going, you know what? You know, I, I want to have the fire of Sekhmet and I, I, I want to have the loving kindness of, of a Bast, Bastet. You know, isn't there a way we can have the best of both worlds that, that connect to women and protect us in a specific sense? And Paquette was very popular for a very long period of time. And so maybe that was uh, an ancient solution to this struggle between if you're nurturing, does that mean you're vulnerable? Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Any other, any other question? Um, what were some of the differences between the proper Tuck cemetery that they found that had been operating for like a thousand years? Yes, or so? yes. Uh, what was the difference that they found between that and like um, the caches of the Tuck mummies that were related to the ritual sacrifice? Okay, so that's a good question. And the question, of course, being is what is the difference between these cat catacombs? <laughs> <laughs> and the ones that were used for ritual sacrifice. Uh, the answer to that question uh, is that in some cases, uh, you're going to have a mixture. Okay. You're going to have a mixture put together where they're going to find mummified cats, and then you're going to find mummified kittens also amongst them because these are areas that are still sacred uh, to, to cats and to their dead. And they're still overseen or protected uh, by by bust, you know, so so they'll be mixed together. So as you're as you're excavating, you're going to find a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And how you know? Oh, I shouldn't even tell. Oh, don't feel bad if I say this. How you know is that is that you'll find an older cat or a cat that's lived its life a little bit, and you know that cat uh, was buried, you know, mummified, probably died of something. But what they did is, sorry, they broke they they they. they it twisted its head, mm -hmm. so they, they broke its neck. Okay. So they originally, so you find a kitten with a broken neck uh, in a mummified context. You know, that one obviously was ritually sacrificed. And the best way of doing that was just to do this. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just real quick. I know it sounds brutal, but then again, remember the Egyptians absolutely love their cats and they do. I mean, hello, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to, you know, somebody kill the cat. Now think about this. What's the contradiction here? Somebody kills the cat, they're going to kill you. And yet, how can you get away with ceremonially, you know, killing these cats? And once again, it's by, it's the art of necessity. So, so this, this uh, sacrifice has to be done in a humane way. It has to be done in, in a way that is ritually proper. Uh, and, and also something where you're asking permission of, of Bast, Bastet, can I do this? And this attitude, by the way, is the way it was with the sacrifice of other animals throughout Egypt. In fact, this custom was very much even a part of, of, of belief systems and perspectives uh, in East Africa and continued and still continues to this day amongst groups in Kenya and Tanzania. Oh, now we're learning too much now, <laughs> so I should stop, but does that make sense? Where in a sense, you have to do something ritually proper in order to, to, to take the life of an animal uh, and they have to in a sense agree or there has to be some kind of agreement in a spiritual sense. So it's, it follows a ritual space. Uh, when, it, when, it, you know, when it comes uh, you know, to, uh, to, to East Africa, when it comes to, you guys ever heard of the Maasai, Maasai tribe? When it comes to them, what you have to do is, you know, these, 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 you know, these cows are sacred, right? But they still eat the cows. You know, they, they still, you know, and so how do they do it? They ask the cow in connection to their, to their, 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 their whole high, uh, the great god, goddess, who is both the black one and the red one. They ask ahead of time, and then the cow indicates whether it's okay or not. So the cow will move its head a certain way to indicate, yes, you can sacrifice me or it, move its head and indicate, no, you're not. And they won't. 
so obviously the kiddies don't agree or disagree, but you have this idea of within a certain sacred space, you can do what you ordinarily can't do outside of that sacred space. And the reality is the main reason why they're doing these rituals was for the very fact of overpopulation. Uh, if they kept taking care of all these cats, the cats would overrun Egypt. You know, and there, there's got to be some way to properly control the population. And I know that seems, and you know, it, it seems brutal. But then again, think about what we're doing here in the United States or in other countries. I have somebody from England here. Uh, look, you know, when it comes to cats, I mean, we're overrun with cats everywhere, right? And there's a lot of cats that don't have any homes. Well, you know, can you imagine a whole society that reveres and worships these cats? How many cats there would be, right? You know, all these cats with kittens, they would become, in a sense, a blight unto itself. So they had to do something that was proper. I know it's hard, but how else they're thinking, well, what would you suggest for, for them to do in ancient Egypt to control the population? Well, but they would rather euthanize the cats than send them away to Phoenicia. Right. They would rather, yes, they would. They they rather euthanize the cats to send them away with the Phoenicians or other groups. So because they believe that these cats have power. And when you took these cats, Egypt lost power. And, and you don't want anybody else to else have the power. You know, you're stealing the power of Egypt away from us. And you saw what, you know, you just can't do that. And of course, the Persians kind of figure things out. It's like, okay, so we're going to use this power idea against them. And that's why they poured out these cats on the, on the battlefield, knowing the Egyptians are all, hey, we're not doing that. We're not going there uh, because they revere cats too much. If they had this idea that we don't like cats, the Egyptians would have gone, we'll just kill those cats and, and lose, I mean, and, sorry, and win the battle. But that didn't happen. I hope that makes sense. So within its ritual, its ritual context, that's how they did things. And yet, if, if they see anybody attacking a cat, being mean to a cat, abusing a cat, it's over. So, so that ending of a life had to be done under a ceremonial context with respect uh, and given to the goddesses. Because, hey, you know, what are you going to do when you got Bost and you got Sekhmet and you got Prakrit? You know, what are you going to do with all, you know, you don't want to make them angry with you. <laughs> so you got to make sure you're as, and who's going to do the, the, the killing of the cat? Uh, it's going to be a priest. It's not going to be anybody else. So basically, that means that if you're somebody else other than the priest, and you go, oh, we have too many kittens here. No, in fact, there is even sources about this. It's like, if you want it, you, you go to the temple, and you give them to the priests there, and then they take care of it. You know, uh, you know, I don't know what happens to it. And sometimes it may live, and sometimes it may not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a ritualistic offering, and you go from there. But at the same time, they're viewed as so powerful that when they're mummies, they would take these mummies and use them for good luck to the point where uh, the cat mummies, even the, even at sometimes the, pow <laughs> the, the, the powder of, of their, of their of, you know, parts of their body were used for various magical charms. Uh, we, we see this from the various magical papyri in Egypt where they're connected to various magical aspects because they, they're believed to have this energy because, hey, look at the kitty. Look at the way, they, I mean, they have so much magic. Look at their eyes. How, how can you deny that when you look at a kitty's eyes, right? Is that, is that making sense? Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah, very good question. Anybody else? Is there any specific perfumes associated with the worship of Bost? Is there specific perfumes uh, um, uh, connected to the worship of, of, of Bostet? It just perfumes in general. Oh. But... Uh, what you did have uh, is that quite a bit of the perfumes, they were looked at as being good because they had a, a bastet head on of it. So the lids were a bastet. And now you know that's a good that's a good perfume because after all, she's there and she's connected to it. And again, the ancient Egyptians are very interesting in so many different ways because everything has multiple purposes, everything. So uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, um, so the perfume, uh, it yes, it's believed uh, to smell good, but perfume is still believed to be magical. It's still believed to be so. So reason why you put perfume on, ladies and maybe men too, right? Cologne, right? Or, or just perfume, right? Reason you put it on because not only because you you know in those days not just because you want to smell good, but you want a special ointment to be protective. And so if it's if it's dedicated to boss, and they did this, there's a business 
where they would make it's like maybe a racket. You know, you have these perfumes and it's like blessed by Bast, blessed by Bast, blessed by Bast. So you get the blessed perfume from Bast and that's a, that's, that's a good thing, right? And it's believed to protect you from what? Well, venom, right? From, from scorpions or snakes or it's supposed uh, to have secure. some, huh? It's a cure all because it's, it's, it's a perfume is not that. By the way, and the same thing when it comes to eye makeup. That's why men and women wore the eye makeup because the eyes were considered so powerful and your soul was connected to it or the, you know, the five aspects of the soul, which is a whole nother lecture, right? And the idea is you got to protect it and delineate it. So what you do is you got to protect it just like you have a cartouche that protects the name of Pharaoh. You got to put the eyeliner on to protect your soul from the evil eye or anything negativity. And so that's why they paint their eyes a certain way is to protect the eyes. And then you take a look at the jewelry and you were and so the Egyptians, they wore jewelry, not because it's pretty. And they did, they, they, they liked it. They did like it because it's pretty, but also all of these are, 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 are magical amulets, right? In so many different ways. And even the face, you know how they paint the faces and put up ointments on there. That's looked at as protecting the face. Well, it did maybe from cancer, right? There's so much sun all the time, right? And they, it's also looked at as, as, uh, uh, as, as this pain in the face is also magical. So, so and that goes back to many beliefs, uh, in ancient beliefs where you do ritual uh, makeup in order to protect yourselves, except for the Egyptians, all the way you know, in Asia, but also Sub-Saharan Africa. And remember, Egypt is connected in many ways to those cultures. And I don't think enough has been done on, on the idea of ancient Egypt in connection uh, to Aksum and Ethiopia and these other traditions where they carry on some of these same traditions. And so, yes, you're going to have, in a sense, the war paint or the paint to protect you for various reasons. And the Egyptians, they make it cosmopolitan. Uh -huh. You know, every day you're going, to, you're going to put on your protective magic, men and women. And remember, even the, the male pharaohs, uh, they are buried with their toiletries, you know, with their makeup case. And they make up their face, they do their eyes, you know, and, you know, is that, you know, and they were, and of course they had their protective amulets and the widgets, right? So far, you know, the scarabs, you know, think about all the, all these different kinds of protective aspects and they're all, you know, to help you, but they look pretty, you know, they're beautiful. Does that, does that make sense? So the Egyptians uh, were all purposeful perfumes are also magical and protective. And when you smell perfume, doesn't that feel like magic? You know, these ideas also, I mean, kind of go even into the Greek and Roman world, right? You know, and, and, and of course that power is then connected to the idea of seduction, right? So it's not just, especially amongst the Greeks with Aphrodite going, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna make this guy love me, <laughs> you know? And I'm gonna cover myself with this perfume. Uh, I'm gonna smell good. And there's, you know, and it's magical in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Sir, do you have anything?